All right, guys. So Mubin, I'm back. So we were talking about the immunoglobulins today, their functions, their properties, their structures. So uh, genetics has been done. So go back to previous lecture, and that is genetics. So here we had been working on a story. I erased that story here, and we'll go back to that story. I wanted to talk here about these structures. So we've, we've done this much, and opsonization is the next. So this is the slightly dis. So opsonization is next, that how, which immunoglobulins opsonize. So very important topic. And I've seen many teachers and I've uh, seen their lectures and I've heard their lectures. Uh, a couple of ways to present this topic. I want to present it in a very interesting way. And that is that I say, out of all of these, uh, you know, uh, first aid has a mnemonic in it and that is GM makes classic cars. And that is the GM activates the classic component, complement component. So opsonization is actually related to the uh, com complement activation as well. So please know that opsonization or function of opsonization by an aminoglobulin is of two types, direct and indirect. So uh, before that, if I step back and if I let's try to see what immunoglobulins are really important so let's do this immunoglobulin g a m e d right gained immunoglobulin d is useless so i know if if an immunoglobulin d is listening to us right now she's sitting in the students and saying oh i am useless i am unique well that is true Immunoglobulin D is unique, but it is useless for the time being. Uh, why? Because we don't know the function yet. It is just sitting as a receptor on the surface of a B cell. We do not know exactly what it does. So D is, for our purposes, out. Don't be upset, Miss D. You will be fine. We will know you more in the future, but at this time we do not know you. So immunoglobulin D is out. Immunoglobulin E is slightly useful. I know, I know if the immunoglobulin E is sitting out there, she's saying, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very useful. Yes, we know you're useful, but medical doctors and medical students and, and medical staff and nurses and paramedics, they know you, the immunoglobulin E, as a negative thing. And that is for allergies, for atopy, for the, for the allergic reactions. So yeah, your, your perception is not good. Your repute is not good. So why is not good? because that is a primary anaphylactic reaction that is caused by the immunoglobulin E. Immunoglobulin E actually has a couple of very useful functions as well. We'll talk about them. But for our discussion, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to narrow the scope of our knowledge. What should we must know? So D, forget about it. Yeah, don't be upset D. E causes allergies. That's it. Stop there. Then we come, we are left with the G, A and M. In the case of G, in the case of A, that is only the immunoglobulin which is present on the mucosal surfaces, so done. We'll talk about it more that hey, it is present in the mucosal surfaces, keeps the antigens at bay from us, and that's it, that is the function of the immunoglobulin A. So we are left with G and M. Now the primary response and secondary response in GM and M will be talked more often. So let's pull these out of the crowd. G and M. And go back to the um, GM makes classic cars. So both of them, what this means is both of them, G and M, activate the complement. The both of them fix the complement. How do they do that? So again, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to uh, go back to the optionization, but for the time being, let me just quickly show you this that. If this is an immunoglobulin, remember these are the, there are light chains and then there are heavy chains, right? And then of course there is the, this is FC fragment, constant of fragment crystallization because it crystallizes, these are light chains, these are heavy chains. The GM, that is immunoglobulin G or immunoglobulin M, their 
FC portion, specially H2 constant region, can attach, complement, and activate it. So, complement fixation or complement activation, same thing, is done by both G and M. They both can cleave, they both can attach to C1 when the C1 of the complement system attaches to the FC portion, then the C1 becomes active. So let me show you that now that we're talking about it. So this is what would happen. <clears throat> Let's say you've got a pathogen, that same pathogen in. Remember we've been making this pathogen. Very happy pathogen. Look at his eyes. He's like all happy. This pathogen has gotten these triangles on it and it has gotten these squares on it or rectangles on it. Now, let's say IgG binds to it. Right, so check this out. The IgG's antigen binding sites are bound to the antigens on the pathogen. And the FC portion has become exposed. Now here is a very important USMLE question. The question is, and a very important medical concept. Why does IgM and IgG not activate the complement when they are just roaming around in the blood? Why is this IgG or IgM not activating the complement and why is this one going to do it? This is very important for a medical student to know. Otherwise, what would happen is if IgG and M just sitting around, moving around in the plasma are just activating the complement, they're going to cause complement activation and they're going to cause a lot of issues for us membrane attack complexes will be formed, they'll kill our cells, the angioedema would occur because the anaphylotoxins that are produced, C5A would act as a chemo attractant and neutrophils will come and they'll be going, hey, where is the fight? Who do we kick? What do we kill? So that would be a problem. So we do not want IgG and M to activate anything until they are working with a pathogen, until they have identified they've arrested a an antigen. So what happens is, when the binding sites become attached to an, anti to an antigen, the FC portion becomes conformationally changed. Remember conformation, conformational change? When something attaches to a protein, the van der Waal forces in the proteins change and the structure of the protein changes. That is called the conformational change. You would know that from the physiology of the receptors. When something attaches to a receptor, the receptor changes its structure and that structure changes creates a second signaling mechanism within the cell. If you do not know it, please go back and read about the receptors and the second messenger systems. I will cover them as well, but don't wait for me, go study. But here, when the antigen antibody or aminoglobulin has connected with the antigen, the conformational change exposes the area on the FC portion where C1 can now come and connect. This is why, so this is like, um, I'm going to put the markers here for a second. So let's say this is my area where I can have, and let's say this is C1 protein. So let's say this is, I'm an immunoglobulin, this is my FC portion and C1 can attach here. And when C1 attaches here, the C1 becomes active and it then cleaves the C4 and C2, that cleaves C3, that cleaves C5, and then 6, 7, 8, 9 become active and the membrane attack complexes are formed. So inflammatory reaction forms once this combination occurs. So this is a very dangerous combination. You don't want it to be occurring in normal physiological states. So how do we prevent that? We prevent it by keeping this area covered. So now even if this thing is present, this thing is not going to be able to attack because it is the, the area where it needs to go is covered. But once the other side attaches to an antigen, the conformational change would release the cover and now this is available, FC portion, H2 area of the FC portion becomes available. Now this thing can be attached here. And what is this thing? This is C1. What does the function of the C1? Once the C1 becomes cleaved or active, it becomes a scissor. 
Once it becomes a scissor, it's going to cleave the C4 and C2 and the whole complement cascade would start. Now this is the classic pathway of attachment of the complement fixation. It needs immunoglobulins to be present. That is why, remember our story, go back to the previous parts of the lecture. When the pathogen came in the body, there were no immunoglobulins because that was a very first time attack and body did not know what kind of a pathogen is it, it is and there were no immunoglobulins. So there was no complement fixation by the immunoglobulins. However, we'll talk about it the next time this will be produced. But before all that, I wanted to create this thing with us in our mind here that the antigen, both G and M, only GM makes classic cars. G and M activate the classic part of the complement. And this is how it is done when the antigen binds to the binding site that creates a conformation change in the FC portion, more specifically H2 part of the FC portion that causes C1 to become attached. Once the C1 is attached, it becomes active, it becomes a scissor and that causes C4 and C2 to become cleaved. We get C4B and C2B that causes C3 to become activated. So then we get C4B, 2B and C3B. From there we get C5 and then the whole cascade goes and membrane attack complexes are formed. So please remember, this is how GM activates the complement. Why did I talk about this in opsonization? This complement activation leads to C3B formation. C3B, I talked about it in this lecture, two parts before, that C3B attaches on the surface of the pathogen and macrophage has a sweet tooth for the C3B. Macrophage can attach with the C3B and opsonize or phagocytose the bacteria or, or virus. So C3B is an opsonin and both G and M can create C3B by complement activation. This is called indirect opsonization. Antibody or immunoglobulin activating the complement creating C3B. C3B then attaching to the surface of the pathogen, opsonizing it. This process is called indirect opsonization. Both G and M do it. Now let's talk about direct opsonization. What direct opsonization is that the same pathogen, if the IgG so let's say there is an IgG attached here. This is IgG. So antigen binding sites are bound to these squares. This is IgG. If IgG attaches on an, with an antigen, if IgG, not IgM, IgM does not have this capability. If IgG attaches with an, an antigen, there is conformational change on the FC side and the FC side becomes capable, please note this, FC side becomes capable of attaching with the macrophages. This is the same thing like here, C3B and IgG are called opsonins. When they coat on the bacteria, macrophage can eat them. Macrophage has receptors for IgG and for C3B. So that is how opsonization occurs. So which immunoglobulin is opsonizing immunoglobulin? Your answer will be two, G and M. The, uh, the person who asks you the question is going to say, no, no, you're wrong. It's only G because G does that and you say no. G does direct opsonization, in which case macrophage can actually directly connect. This is a macrophage. Can directly connect with the IgG FC portion, the other side is attached to the antigen and then it can phagocytose that. Why did this connection occur? When the antigen binding occurred, conformational change occurred that exposed the macrophage connection site on the FC and then the macrophage connected, right? So you would say, yeah, sure, IgG is direct opsonin. However, 
IgG and IgM both, let's say this was IgM and this is IgG, they both are indirect obstinates. Why? Because IgG can actually activate the C1 as well. And from there, of course, C4 and C2, from there C3, from there C5, and then 6, 7, 8, and 9 membrane attack complexes. Right? So both of them are indirect opsonizing and IgG is direct opsonizing. So that is the opsonization function D, E, A do not opsonize. A, that also means they do not opsonize directly or indirectly. That means they do not activate complement and they do not directly create opsonization with the macrophages. Only one immunoglobulin IgG is direct opsonizer. One only. Then two which are indirect, G and M. So we'll stop here and we'll continue with our structure. Thank you.